Hey guys, HBO Max deal here. It may have taken a while, but we are now here. Because I've been working on a project where I'm reviewing every film, some people may have seen this coming. Also, for anyone who has seen this film or for anyone who saw the title of this video, you've also seen it coming. It's actually kind of pretty hard to think otherwise. Because today, I am talking about the only film that is rated under 50% on Rotten Tomatoes and the only film that has a mixed review on Metacritic. A film that was supposed to tell the fan base, hey, Hayao Miyazaki isn't going to be here forever and the studio's in good hands, but instead triggered some father-son issues when production began. This is one of the very few films I've seen where the story behind the film is better than the film itself, here on the latest edition of The Studio J Project. Wait, what the fuck? The Studio J Project. Oh, right. Oh, hard G. I need to do a hard G from now on. Yeah, I was told if I didn't do hard G that I'll be given the femur breaker, so the Studio Ghibli Project. Episode 16, Tales from Earth Sea. All right, here's some spoilers around the movie. For anyone who doesn't want to listen, go to this timestamp. You've been warned. Three, two, one. Tales from Earth Sea follows a wizard named Sparrowhawk who is trying to find out why the world around him is going to shit, with the biggest red flag being the sudden appearance of dragons in a world where there shouldn't be any. While searching for the truth, he finds a boy named Aaron, a runaway prince who had just killed his father moments earlier in a strange impulse. That impulse is shown later as she rescues a girl named Theru from slave traders, and the trio then discover who is behind the imbalance and Aaron's sudden impulses, a witch named Cobb whose goal is to be immortal, and the only way that the trio can make everything go back to normal is to kill him. The film was adapted from a couple of sources. One is from the first four books of the Earthsea series by Ursula K. Le Guin and The Journey of Shuna, a manga by the legend himself Hayao Miyazaki, who was one of many directors who tried to get the rights to Le Guin's book series back in the early 80s to no avail after he sent a letter of interest to her. According to producer and Ghibli co-founder Toshio Suzuki, if the rights to Earthsea were given to Miyazaki then, before the studio was even made, Nausicaa, The Valley of the Wind, would have never have been made in the first place. Le Guin then expressed interest towards Ghibli after she saw that the same guy who wrote to her 20 years prior had just won an Oscar for Spirited Away, making him the perfect person to adapt her books, in her opinion. But there was a problem. He was already working on Howl's Moving Castle. The decision was then given to Suzuki to find a new director for Ghibli's newly acquired project. He ended up going with Hayao's son, Goro Miyazaki, a landscaper who created the design for the Studio Ghibli Museum, which opened in 1998 and was its director at the time for his directorial debut. When Hayao found out about Suzuki's decision, he was completely against it, as he didn't believe Goro had the necessary experience to be at the helm of an animated feature film, but ended up accepting it after Suzuki showed him Goro's drawings of what would turn into the first poster for the film. Hayao and Suzuki then proceeded to go to Le Guin's home in Oregon to inform her of the update, and just like with Hayao, she didn't like the news, but was fine with it when she was told that Hayao would oversee the production. But this is where the issues began, between father and son. Production for the film began in August of 2005. According to an interview and a few blog posts by Goro, before production officially started, he said to his team that when the film was done, he would go back to being the director at the Ghibli Museum, hoping to give people who were skeptical about the result of the film a sigh of relief. But it did anything but for Hayao, who lashed out at his son for making himself an escape route in case the film goes bad and not going forward with the project entirely. Apparently, this was followed by a shouting argument between the two, and they reportedly never spoken a word to each other during the eight months it took to make the film, something that Goro was all too familiar with, as he recalls not seeing his father often as a kid because he was always working at the studio, saying because he didn't see him often, he learned who he was through the films he made, saying, quote, For me, Hayao Miyazaki gets zero marks as a father, but full marks as a director of animated films. The production for the film was finished on May 23rd, 2006, and was shown in theaters on July 29th. Although the movie did well financially in Japan because it's a Studio Ghibli film, it was panned by critics and fans of the Earthsea book series, even giving Miyazaki a Golden Raspberry Award for Worst Director, which in my opinion 
is a bit too harsh. It's one thing to make a film that's not seen as a classic, but the problem I see in the response Goro got was the fact that he made it with a legendary animation studio. I can see how a lot of people got their hopes up after seeing utter classics come out of the head of his father in the 10 years prior to his film's release. Hell, it even got so bad that Ghibli decided to put it in their marketing campaign for the film. The producer Toshio Suzuki said in a number of commercials about Tales of Tales from Earth Sea that this would be a quote unquote parent versus child showdown, implying that there was even a solid matchup in the first place between a guy who's considered a god in the world of animation versus his son who is a landscaper for the stu for his studio for his father's studio's museum. Jesus, that was a lot of words. One thing that critics can't help but compare to Hayao's films with Tales from Earthsea is the story, to which I say, yeah, it is different from what we're used to seeing. The film takes things more seriously than the studio's previous films did. The tone reminiscent of Princess Mononoke and the pacing is what really ruins the movie. We're told at the beginning that there is something wrong with the world, yet that's not what we see. That's not what happens. There's a sense of excitement that you get when you start watching, but then it gets taken away from you minute after minute by long stretches of nothing and scenes that just come off as unnecessary and severed from the prologue, severed from the plot. But the story and message we do get is one that Ghibli is very familiar with expressing, which is life is short and you need to appreciate what you have once in a while. And it's shown in the film through surrounding the story on a few certain characters from Le Guin's first four books and the screenwriters Goro and Keiko Niwa, whose last writing credit for Ghibli had been 13 years earlier in Ocean Ways under the pseudonym Kaori Nakamura, doing a solid job in not cramming four books into a nearly two hour film. The characters were overall underwhelming, and this is also where a majority of the comparisons come in, which makes sense because, again, Goro had to watch his father's films to even know who the guy is. Sparrowhawk wasn't memorable, Theru comes off as a less appealing version of San for Mononoke, Cobb is the biggest letdown in this whole thing because all he does is just stand there and looks creepy. That's it. Even the slave trader that took Theru was more interesting than the main antagonist in this film. But the one character that sticks out to me is Eren, because when it comes to Ghibli films, he's a fucking oddity. Out of all the reviews I've done so far, this is the first angsty teenage boy in a Ghibli film that I can remember. Eren had a shot at being like Ashitaka, but his development was very vague and overall just not memorable. The animation is overall very solid, with its best strength being the backgrounds and the dream sequences in the film, which varies visually, but are still really good because Ghibli. The character designs, meanwhile, look way more simplistic than it should be, which makes sense if you add to the fact that the guy who did the character designs from Tales from Earth Sea also did the character designs for Howl's Moving Castle, but let me reiterate what I said earlier, it took eight months to make Tales from Earth Sea, while for Howl's Moving Castle, it took 17 months. So he had more time to make Howl's Moving Castle. The, that's, that's the reason why Tales from Earth Sea looks way worse. Instead of Johi Saishi, we have Tamiya Tedashima with the soundtrack, who provides a number of somber and climatic orchestral tracks with a medieval feel that fits the theme fairly well but not anything that would stay in your head after the film was over. Just like with the majority of these films, I watched the dub, and surprisingly, that wasn't memorable either, even though some of the cast members were Willem Dafoe, Jess Harnell, and Cheech Marin. If I gotta be completely honest with you guys, this is very hard to just see this film without looking at what came before it. By itself, it's pretty decent, with pretty visuals, but... Because the Ghibli name is on it, it's safe to say it's the worst one under the studio's name. Goro would end up directing another movie for Ghibli that would be way better than this in From Up on Poppy Hill, but for now, it just shows he's not ready yet. Keep in mind this was during a time where we didn't know how long Hayao was going to direct films. As he said after Mononoke and after Spirited Away, I believe also after House Moving Castle, I don't know for sure, where he threatened he was going to retire and said he did eventually. And that opened Studio Ghibli's eyes and they decided that they needed some young blood at the helm of their films. They would get that eventually in Hiromasa Yonobayashi, but at the time he was only an animator and was an assistant animation director for Tales from Earth Sea. But for now, the future of Ghibli stayed in the Miyazaki name. When HBO Max adds this film among many of Ghibli's films in 2020, I do suggest if you check it out if you haven't. Who knows, you may like it, you may hate it, but just remember, it's a Miyazaki film. 
not a Miyazaki classic. I'm giving Tales from Earthsea a 6 out of 10. Thank you guys for watching this Tales from Earthsea review video. If you like this video, hit the like button down below. If you want to see more videos like this, hit the subscribe button. And if there's any videos that you want to see that I've made before, there are some videos on the screen as well as down in my channel. And once again, with the latest edition of the Studio Ghibli Project, my name is Payne, and I'll see you in the next video. Aw, oh, shit.